Johnson. And I'm Bryce. And, and we're, we're Better, Better Half Reviews. And today we are looking at Viscounts of the West Kingdom. It's brought to you by Shem Phillips and S.J. MacDonald. The art is by the Miko, and it's published by Garfield Games. Viscounts of the West Kingdom is set in a time where the king is losing power, and you as a Viscount are trying to balance favoring the people and being loyal to the king. So you go around constructing buildings, working in the castles, translating manuscripts, getting deeds, and hopefully helping the land prosper. But it might fall into poverty. So let's look at what's in the game. All right, so this is the setup of the game with one player board in front. When you're getting ready to play the game, these boards are actually double-sided. So depending on your player count, you put a certain side up and match everything up and the castle holds everything together. Every person gets a player deck that matches their color of choice. So we chose red. And before you start, everybody needs to pick a hero card and resources that go along with it. All right, so let's say I picked this hero, and it tells me, the card with it, what resources I'm supposed to get when I start the game. And the number up top is where my Viscount is going to start on the board. This card also becomes your reference card for the game. Your hero card goes into your player deck and gets shuffled in, and you're ready to start. So let's talk about the board first before we get into the logistics of the player board. Your Viscount will travel around the board, and there's different arrows throughout guiding you where to go. There are neutral townsfolk on each board, and there's also different manuscripts. These are some of the things that may help you get some more commodities or powers on your turn. Around the very edge is where you can place buildings, and you can also earn bonuses as well. And right in the middle is the castle board. You can't miss it. This is a special part of the game where your meeples will be going. So in Viscounts, the order of your actions is very important and the player board helps you know what you're supposed to do. So when it's your turn, you're gonna have three cards to choose from. Choose one card and place it on your board. And now you're going to follow this track on your player board to do your turn. So first place a card and then we'll talk about the skulls later. The first thing that you're going to do is move your Viscount. Your Viscount moves depending on the number within the coin. So he can move two or more. So follow the arrows on the board, one, two. If you wanted to move any extra, simply pay one coin per spot that you move extra. You can choose to dismiss a card on the board in that section that you're at. If you do, you gain their abilities and this bonus action up top if you so choose. You don't have to, that's optional. But then your main actions to choose from are right here. You can choose to trade, build a building, place a worker, or transcribe a manuscript. You choose one of those actions and then you move to the next step. The next action is hire. If you want to, you can choose to hire this person who is adjacent to you on that same board. And the cost is the coin up at the top left. If you choose to hire them, they go in your discard pile. After you've done that, you check your corruption and virtue. If these tokens collide, something happens. We'll get into that in just a moment. And finally, you draw back up to three, and your turn ends. OK, so let's actually walk through a turn. I place down my card. I have a movement of two. When you're on the outside of the board, you can trade or build a building if you have enough commodities for it. If I had chosen to go to the inside of the board, I would be able to place a worker on the castle because I'm next to it, or I could have transcribed a manuscript, which as you notice is on the inside of the circle. So let's say that I went here. If you notice on my card, I have the cleric symbol right there. And also on the board, there's an extra cleric symbol. You can use some of these symbols at the very beginning of the game, but obviously as the board fills up, you won't be able to use these again. So right now I have two cleric symbols and my inkwell also counts for a cleric symbol, and it has that on the board right here. I can discard that because I have one, two, three. That is the cost of this manuscript to transcribe, and it gives you a bonus, and that would let me hire a worker for free. So I can hire any one of the five workers that are available. Whoever I hire, I put it in my discard pile. If they have a symbol up here at the top right, 
you have that action that you are allowed to do right now. If I had instead chosen to place a worker with the nobility symbol, I have one symbol on my board, and then I have two other gold available, which also go with nobility. If I discard three total, I can place two workers on the castle in the section that I'm next to. Alternatively, if I had chosen to go up here on the board, I would be able to place a building, but buildings have different costs. So this building costs five, seven, and three. Right now I have one, two, three available. I can build the smallest building, the workshop, and you place it on one of these squares right next to you. So if I place it here, it lets me have a bonus action. And also, when you place a building, it reveals different icons that can help you throughout the game. The other option on the outside of the board is trading. So it has the little blue bags here. This one says for every two bags, you can earn an inkwell. Currently, I only have these two blue bags available. So I could do one trade to earn one inkwell. However, if I wanted more, the symbol that matches with the trade are coins. I could trade two coins for one more inkwell. So let's say on another one of my turns, I choose to place the thief. You notice they have a purple skull up top. That adds to your corruption. So anytime you place a card with a skull, you'll move it over. Your corruption and virtue track will intersect at some point along the way because you do things that gain you virtue and you do things that gain you corruption. When they collide, when you get to this point of your turn, after you've done all these steps, you're going to do a corruption check. And it may not always be your turn when your corruption and virtue markers collide. But you'll only check it when it comes to this part of your turn. So they collided right here. That means that I'm going to gain one deck card and two coins. And then everyone else, if they have zero skulls on their board, would move their virtue marker one over to the left. After you've taken care of the corruption check, you put them back on their starting spots. All the different cards on the left side give you how much they cost or also how much their movement is with the Viscount. They will have different symbols for their abilities and also on the right side of the card are different abilities. The Lightning Bolt, when you play this card on your board, you'll gain those resources. This card, as long as he's on your board and you gain a debt, you can do one of these two actions. The thief, when they are discarded off your board, you gain a debt and a coin. And the abbot gives you nothing. When it's your turn and you have to play a card and all the spots are full, you simply slide them all over one and place your card. So as you're doing that throughout the game, that's when some of those effects come into play. So the thief has that X. When they are discarded, that is when you would gain the debt and the coin. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the castle area. So anytime you have three of your workers all in one section, you're gonna do some movement. One person will move up, and when you're on the outer row, it has these arrows. So one person will move to the right, one person to the left. Whoever moved up, you gain that reward immediately. So this one I could choose to gain a gold, or I could move one of my workers on the outside to the left. I'll take a gold. However, if I had three workers here in the middle, I would move one up and I can gain any resource I desire. And these do not move, it is only the outer layer that would move left and right. All right, so let's say that I had some opponents here. I have three workers here at the bottom, I'd move up, over, and over. And then I can't move any more workers up because I don't have three of a kind. Once all of your movement is done, if you end up with one section that has four or more workers, you are allowed to bump one off. You can choose to bump off your own or someone else's. When a worker is bumped off of the castle, depending on what level they were at, they get those rewards listed. So they were on the second level, they would be able to move one marker over for the virtue and gain one resource. And then you'll see there's no reward listed on level three because once you get there, no one can be bumped off. And at the end of the game, the different levels that your workers are left at will get you different points, and that's listed on the card as well. When you're placing workers on the castle, there are times where you can have chain reactions. So again, you start with the outer layer. I have three here, so I'd move one up, 
one over, one over. Gain my reward, and then you check the outer layer and see if you have any with three or more, which I do. Go up, over, over, gain my reward. Now you check the next layer, which I do have three here, so I would go up, gain my reward, and these guys stay, and you're done with your movement. There are two ways that this game can come to an end. You have the deed pile and the debt piles. If either of these are drawn down to their respective cards, that triggers the end of the game. It doesn't have to be both of them, just one of them at least. When that happens, let's say that the debt card was revealed. This will flip over and you have the poverty card. That means that every player who has turned over deed cards will earn a certain amount of points. The person who has the most of these flipped over will gain 12 and so on. Same goes for the prosperity card. You flip it over and those who have turned over the most debt cards will receive a reward. There are cases in games where both of these are revealed. Depending on the number of players in your game, there are a different amount of debt and deed cards on top to start your game. So in a two player game we'll have 12 of these on top and 12 of these on top in this one as well. So there may be different strategies you can go for depending on the cards that are being taken throughout the game. Again so once one of those are revealed you flip it over you finish that current round and then everybody gets one more turn and the game is over and you count up all the victory points and the person with the most victory points is the winner. All right, so that's how you play the game. Let's talk about how we feel about it. So, what are the pros? Well, I like with this game that it's a little bit more compact. Yes, there's still a lot going on, but the board is all in just like one little section. And I love that the board is modular. So depending on like your player count, you're going to be flipping it over, and there's different orders that you can put it in. You're supposed to do it randomly. But I like that you never know where everything's going to lay out, and there's different cards, and the manuscripts, like everything. There's so many different choices and change it up. So like the previous West Kingdom games, there's a lot of replayability with the setup and with the different cards that you can use, um, but it does have a lot smaller of a footprint than the other games did. It's still kind of a table hog, but it's definitely a lot smaller. I definitely appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, one of the biggest positives is how the end game is triggered. There's two different ways to trigger it, and depending on how it's triggered, you could score points differently, which I really like. So you don't know exactly, you know, how many points you have or how many points you can have until you right up to the end of the game. And then you're like, oh, crap. OK, now we really need to, like, get more of those cards or do more of this or that. But you can really drive the game with what gets flipped over and you can, like, boost it if you want the game to end. You can just keep going for stuff for that, and it's like, no, stop! <laughs> so, yeah, we had a, a game that we played in about 15 minutes, and mm -hmm. that's because I kept getting those deed cards, and kept getting those deed cards, and it hurt me in the end because Allison had one debt card flipped over, and I had zero. <laughs> so she got the extra 12 points. It's like, oh, man, like, I really drove that game, but yep. it might not have been the best decision. That brings up another point as well. So with those uh, poverty and prosperity cards, it can really change up how long your game is. So we've had really short games. We've had really long games because there's one game where like none of us were getting any of those cards. It just wasn't working out. And then we're like, oh, right. <laughs> we should probably do something about that. So it really depends on what cards you have and how you're playing and how the other players are playing. You could have a really long game or you could have a short game. So something else that I find interesting with this game. You have the virtue and corruption um, kind of all together and they move a lot during the game and yes you may earn cards that give you negative points but I'm not really thinking about it that way because usually when I'm playing architects I'm trying to like avoid all those negatives and I don't want any of those negative points and here I'm like okay whatever I've got negative 10 points just sitting on my board that's okay I'll convert them over into resources eventually. It's so different. Yeah, it really does change up the dynamic of that debt card, where it's something that you don't fear in this game. Um, you get a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a lot of it if you want. The little Viscount Meeple, so over the top, and I love it. You got the horse and the flag and everything. It's legit. 
It is. And I was worried like this would be kind of fragile just because there's a lot of little kind of pieces to it, like a lot of areas where it gets really skinny. But it's actually pretty pretty sturdy. Like mm -hmm. I mean I wouldn't throw it anywhere, but yeah. Oh well, yeah, I wouldn't good. abuse it, but it's not something that you have to just like barely touch or be super gentle with because you're afraid it's gonna break. It's actually pretty sturdy. Mm -hmm. And the other really cool part about this game is the castle in the middle, the 3D castle. I love that, you know, like you can put your little meeples in it and they move up towards the top. And that's also another way of adding variability because the castle, you don't know which orientation you're gonna have when you set up the game. But I will say one of the biggest cons for me is that castle. That's true. <laughs> um, you get a lot of meeples on that castle and my big fat fingers start knocking everything around <laughs> and even if you have skinny fingers you're going to be knocking them around <laughs> it just it's very you know you got to work on your dexterity there you know picking up some meeples and moving them around on that castle by counts of the west kingdom the castle the dexterity game because <laughs> yeah it can get become a little tricky moving meeples when there's a lot of them that is true you do like knock things over you know despite trying to be super careful but it's so cool moving up the meeples, and I'll just fix them. <laughs> so what are some cons for you? Um, so on the board, you have all the different little arrows giving you directions. But when you have the stacks of cards and the stacks of manuscripts, sometimes those arrows get a little bit hidden. And you're like, wait, which way can I move? I, it's not a huge thing. It takes me just two seconds to like move something or whatever and look around. but. Sometimes I just want to like know immediately, okay, yeah, I can go here. It's a little bit harder to tell, but I appreciate that it's not like a glaring neon yellow or something saying, move here. And when you play it a couple times, you begin to know like, okay, this spot's going to have the arrow going this way and that way. This spot's going to have the arrow going this way and that way. And you just can move around the board without having to look. Some people can, <laughs> not me. <laughs> So one thing that is a negative for me, when you're supposed to set up the game and you have the Poverty and Prosperity cards, um, I mean, it makes sense, but you know, when you have a two-player game, you have 12 cards that are on top, and you put this little card in between to have like all the excess on the bottom, and then when you reveal this card, oh, you know, the game is going to end, which is nice, but these cards are so slippery, and so this kept like getting knocked over and sliding all over the place, so... I don't put the cards underneath. I just have the cards on top. And then when it's revealed, okay, cool, we know the game's gonna end. If you need any more cards, they're over here. That was my thing, like, it's a quick fix, but they're so slippery. I have no desire to set it up how I'm supposed to. So overall, what are your thoughts about the game? I really like the game. I like uh, the different aspects that they took from the earlier West Kingdom games and made them different. So like the Corruption and Virtue Track is a little different. Debt cards aren't such a bad thing anymore. Um, I just like the twists that they put on the game. Definitely. I do really like that, where it's like got the similarities of the games, but throws in a different twist. And I really like the, the modular board and how everything is more compact. It's easier to see everything around because it's close. And I don't know, I love the structure of the turn. So it tells you, okay, you do this, now choose one of these. Now do one of these. That helps me to have less analysis paralysis most of the time. Yeah, the player boards are really well designed and, and help with that process. So I really like this game. I would definitely recommend it. It's a fantastic game in the West Kingdom series. It's perfectly splendid. So be sure to like and subscribe and check us out on Instagram. We're doing a lot of fun stuff over there. All right, I'm Allison. And I'm Bryce, and we're Better Half Reviews. Happy gaming. Have fun. Yeah, I would recommend it as well. It's okay. great. <laughs> That's not what I was going for. What were you going for? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. It's great. Splendid. Absolutely splendid. Perfectly splendid. Or perfectly splendid. <laughs>